Welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. I'm your host, Fabian Korver. Today we are joined by Lisa Heldke. Lisa Heldke is a professor of philosophy, affiliated faculty in gender, women, and sexuality studies, and director in Nobel Conference at Gustavus Adolphus College. She is committed to exploring the philosophical significance of food, a topic about which philosophers historically have had very little to say. She has published numerous articles as well as four authored or co-edited books, including Exotic Appetites, Ruminations of a Food Adventurer, and Philosophers at Table on Food and Being Human. Lastly, she's also on the editorial board for the Encyclopedia of Food and Agriculture Ethics, published by Springer Publishing. You can find all the relevant links to Professor Heldke's books in the description of this video. I hope you enjoyed this episode. The Dare to Know podcast is now also available on iTunes and Spotify. Please check out the links in the description below. Lisa, welcome to the Dare to Know podcast. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, thank you so much for uh, being here. I'm very excited to start, you know, this new series, you know, on the philosophy of food. Um, so it's great to have you here uh, as our uh, first uh, guest. So maybe just, you know, to start off, if you could tell uh, my audience a little bit more about, you know, yourself, your background, and, and how did you get interested mm -hmm. in, you know, the philosophy of food? Sure. Uh, so I uh, got interested in food uh, first. And from the time I was a little kid, I was always interested in things in the kitchen. But then I got interested in philosophy and went off, well, I, I went to college and then I got interested in philosophy uh, and then went re got really interested in philosophy and went off and did a PhD in it. Um, but at that time, I was interested in ep questions of epistemology, um, which at that time really meant like philosophy of science. You know, there was really almost no space for anything other than uh, philosophy of science when I was doing my PhD. In, but I... I valiantly um, insisted that I was actually not doing philosophy of science. And in the very last chapter of my dissertation, which was in, um, it was looking at the concept of objectivity. I developed this analogy in which I said that uh, the, the model of objectivity that I was offering was kind of like a recipe. And I talked about how we should think about a recipe as a set of suggestions. Um, and uh, a friend at the time said, you know, that's an interesting idea. You should write that up. And so I, um, I did. I, my first, maybe not my very first published piece, but a first published piece for me was this uh, article called Recipes for Theory Making. Mm -hmm. uh, and believe it or not, I tried to go around and <laughs> get a job with that as a job talk. And this was in like, you know, 1986. In other words, a long time ago. And I assure you that no one thought this was a good idea. It was a really terrible idea on my part uh, because no one thought that philosophy of food was a thing. And certainly mm -hmm. no one thought that thinking about recipes seriously was a thing. I mean, food studies as a larger interdisciplinary activity was really getting its feet on the ground then. So, and philosophy is, you know, as you know, is not really a, they're not sort of first out of the blocks in uh, exploring new, new ideas. And so the idea of thinking that I could get a job by talking about re recipes philosophically in 1986 was really, a really spectacularly terrible idea. Uh, but that's how I started thinking about it. And, you know, fortunately, I made my way to, you know, a liberal arts college where well, honestly, it's my alma mater. I like to say that that's not why I got the job, but it was a place where I could uh, start exploring these ideas and in fact, exploring them with a colleague, Dean Curtin. Uh, and we produced a long time ago, maybe 1992, we produced an anthology called Cooking, Eating, Thinking, which was sort of an early work in the philosophy of food. So I really think it was being at a, a liberal arts college, a place where you know, you are expected to be intellectually curious, but you're not straight jacketed. That was mm -hmm. a real gift to me um, and gave me permission to explore food philosophically. No, that's Long winded great. answer. Of Mm -hmm. No, that's great. And I think, you know, that led to sort of the more recent book. I think it's, you know, uh, from 2017, if I'm uh, correct, uh, that you uh, co-wrote uh, titled uh, Philosophers at Table on Food and Being Human. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, right. you know, that's a very interesting book, Philosophy of Food. I, I really, uh, you know, uh, like the book and, you know, the, the broader perspective and how it sort of touches upon mm -hmm. all these different topics uh, within philosophy, you know, ethics, epist epistemology, metaphysics. So it was, you know, very mm -hmm. surprising uh, to me, you know, being new to the philosophy of food, understanding, you know, sort of the broad picture and how food and philosophy are sort of interrelated. And um, so you start off, you know, right. in, in the book uh, asking the question and you argue, you know, how are we to eat? And, and you say, you know, this might be one of the most deepest, most profound and most natural 
questions a philosopher could ask, which, you know, might surprise a few people. So could you maybe mm -hmm. explain, you know, what is so deep about this question? Sure. Uh, and before I go anywhere, let me just say that, um, yeah, my co-author of this book is Ray Boisvert. And uh, I'm a little bit, um, I feel like I'm doing this interview with a broken arm because <laughs> Ray uh, is really, we were really co-authors of this book. Uh, uh, each of us started two of the chapters, I guess, uh, but we swapped them back and forth probably three or four times and really completely rewrote them. And Ray is an incredible historian of philosopher of philosophy, and I am not. <laughs> so, uh, so some of my answers will be very incomplete because because Ray should be answering them. However, um, this question I can certainly um, field. Um, uh, we start the book by talking about the many ways that you can ans ask that question, how are we to eat? You know, it can mean something like, uh, you know, we, th we think maybe about questions like, uh, you know, the simple question of vegetarianism or the question of, well, you know, in the middle of the summer, how are we, how are we to eat when it's really hot outside? Or how are we to eat uh, in a way that uh, treads gently on the earth? Or how are we to eat in accordance with our religious uh, practices? And when you start thinking about those questions, you, you quickly realize that you are really doing a tour of philosophy as we have conceived of it. It can um, have aesthetic meanings, it can have ethical meanings, it can have political meanings and certainly religious. And I wanna say even uh, you know, ontological and epistemological meanings, which might seem a little bit more obscure, but it really, uh, it, thinking, Thinking about what we eat, it turns out, takes you to every single corner of human existence. So, no, that's very uh, fascinating. Okay. So, in the beginning, uh, you also start sort of talking about how we should conceive of philosophy, right? So, you talk about philosophy as plumbing, mm -hmm. which, again, might sound as a surprise for uh, some people. And, and then you also talk about, you know, what is sort of the, the mm -hmm. occupation of a philosopher. And, and you sort of identify three. So mm -hmm. you talk about the poet, the lawyer, and I think you guys basically add the farmer. Um, so what is this yeah. idea of philosophy as plumbing? And, you know, how should we think about those occupations? Mm hmm. Yeah, so, uh, and we credit uh, the philosopher Mary Midgley with this idea of philosophy as plumbing. And obviously it's a very homey metaphor and indeed one that might put some people off, right? Philosophers have tended historically to have kind of big egos and to think that, you know, what we do is very lofty and high flying and to suggest that instead, you know, we're carrying waste away from the house isn't very uh, uh, dramatic or, or attractive. Uh, but the idea is that, um, a plumbing system in a house is a really elaborate thing, you know, involving both fresh water and wastewater. And it's really vital, you know, the, well, I mean, I say that <laughs> despite the fact that this summer I'm, as usual, I'm living in a place with no plumbing at all, but let's set that aside. Uh, we think of this, at, you know, uh, taking in water is vital to us. And we also know that, you know, humans eliminating waste is vital. So these are systems that absolutely have to work. And when they don't work though, we all know we who own houses that we try to hobble along as long as we can. Like we'll pour a little Drano down the kitchen sink or we'll, um, we'll put some tape around a pipe that seems to be leaking. What we don't want to do is rip out all the walls and put in all new pipes because it's a really elaborate um, and difficult project. So Midgley suggests that that's sort of the way that we um, that we should think about philosophy. We all operate with, you know, systems of philosophical plumbing behind our, you know, the walls of our lives, whether that be ontological assumptions about, you know, what there is in the world, um, what it is to be a human being, uh, epistemological questions about, you know, what counts as evidence for our beliefs. All those things are, are really the, the plumbing in our walls. Uh, and when one of those uh, pipes starts to not work very well for us, the first thing we don't think is, well, I guess we should ex re-examine our fu most fundamentally held beliefs. Uh, but sometimes that becomes important. Um, so the other question you asked is about those three occupations, the lawyer, the, 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 the poet farmer and the, and, farmer. And the poet. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the poet. Interesting, I forgot that one. Mm -hmm. So for Midgley, those first two involve that kind of sense of vision you know, don't, don't ask me how I get from point A to point, you know, Q to the third, but I, but I can see it from here. That's what the poet gives us is the opportunity to sort of imagine ourselves into 
a new way of understanding. Whereas uh, the lawyer gives us that kind of doggedness, that kind of step-by-step -step thinking about how can we actually get to at least Q sub, you know, Q to the first, if, even if not Q to the third. Uh, we suggest that another uh, occupation, and right, Midgley doesn't literally mean that you have to be a poet and literally mean that you have to be a lawyer. Those are, you know, kind of metaphorical examples. And we metaphorically add to that the notion of a farmer. And, you know, some people in early drafts of the book quibbled like, well, you know, nowadays farmers, and we're like, yeah, 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 we know. But let's think about, you know, what what do we evoke when we when we mention the farmer? And uh, among the things we evoke are this notion that we have to engage with the world. And we can't think in terms of sharp self other divisions or in terms of sharp theory practice divisions. The farmer is someone who's constantly engaging with the material world, but in ways that require them very actively to think about, well, in principle, if it rains, you know, the way it's been raining for the last couple of years, what's gonna happen in that field? Or in principle, given that we have about another couple of weeks of uh, growing time, thanks to climate change, what does that mean for how I, how, I, um, how I can grow crops? So that farmer for us adds in that layer, uh, something that's really at the heart of our, our work, which is an understanding that um, these dichotomies of self and other and theory and practice that undergird so much of Western philosophy um, don't work very well. So we're really, we're really inviting in the farmer to help us to think through that, that um, conundrum or that, that problem. So, so and, and when we take this approach, like philosophy as plumbing and then enter, you know, the field of ethics, which is, you know, the first part of your book, we start talking about, you know, the food, virtue, hospitality. So um, maybe you could sketch a little bit of uh, context, you know, towards understanding what is, you know, the relevance of, you know, this specific virtual hospitality, you know, why should we focus on that one? Right. Uh, and so, yes, uh, someone encountering this book. And by the way, we really wrote this book. We were invited to write this book um, as an introduction to thinking about, well, you can think of it as an introduction to thinking about food or an introduction to thinking about philosophy, whichever, yeah, whichever yeah. end of the stick you want to pick that up. But it's, um, we were really trying to write it for people who are not starting out with a PhD in philosophy or maybe even a BA or even a single solitary course. We hope it's uh, readable by anyone who might be interested in philosophical approaches to these questions. So um, depending on where you, you know, the perspective from which you come at this book, you may or may not be surprised to see us start by talking about hospitality. In the history of Western philosophy, the idea that hospitality was a virtue or that it was, for heaven's sakes, an essential virtue or an important virtue would be regarded as ludicrous, right? I mean, it's it's been regarded as, you know, trivial, maybe a nice thing to have, but certainly nothing like vital. And we're really trying to pay attention to it and to say that by thinking about the relationship between host and guest, words that in pretty old Italian and pretty old French are actually the same. I just had a conversation with last week who were French and Italian speakers who said, yeah, we don't really talk that way now. We use, we use words, we use different words to talk about host and guest, but you're absolutely right. Those words are there in our languages and we hadn't really sort of thought about the fact that they're the same word. But uh, these folks um, in, the, in this relationship, um, this reciprocal relationship have responsibilities to each other. And in the book, we start out with some various examples about the kinds of quandaries that, uh, that hosts and guests find themselves in today uh, as a result of the fact that we are quite attentive to food and that many people find themselves for one reason or another having constraints on their diets. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people find themselves uh, welcoming to their home people with different dietary needs and, and desires. And figuring out how to do that, uh, figuring out how to negotiate those things. It's, it's not at all trivial. I mean, it is, it is literally sometimes a matter of life and, and death, right? Uh, you know, if you feed the wrong kid a peanut butter cookie, um, that child dies um, and that's not funny. And nor is, it, uh, nor is it trivial to say, I'm sorry, I just accidentally fed you food that violates your most deeply held religious beliefs. Um, yeah. 
So those are, you know, those are really, really important things. And they are under the umbrella of hospitality. Likewise, showing up and saying to your guests, oh, or your host, oh, you know, just this morning I was reading about this diet and I've decided I am going to be vegan and gluten-free um, starting now with this meal. You know, that's also, <laughs> yeah. that shows a breach of, um, of, of ethics on the part of the guest, I guess I would say. Mm-hmm. So lots of opportunities to think about that. Yeah, no, certainly. And I mean, so it, it sort of engages you as a reader, right? Like, you know, where does the responsibility lie? And I think, you know, that's an in- interactive way of like sort of approaching uh, this question. And I also like that, you know, it's not just about the philosophy. You also, I mean, while you say philosophy has sort of ignored uh, this uh, issue of hospitality or even worse like they don't want to deal with it because they don't think it's ethics like you do say but literature has paid attention you know uh, throughout the years so so, uh, maybe you could also introduce that a little bit I thought that was also very interesting you know looking through the lens of literature how can we understand this question right and and just one before I turn to that one note about um, your observation about philosophy ignoring it I know that you have have spent time thinking about Kant and Kant um, (laughs) Kant, you know, one of Kant's most famous examples is this one about, you know, someone coming to the door and saying, you know, someone coming to the door to kill someone and saying, you know, are you hiding this person? And and Kant, you know, with his categorical imperative says, you got to tell the truth. There's no exceptions to this. So, you know, never mind if the person dies as a result of you telling the truth, your responsibility is to tell the truth. So, um, you know, clarity, consistency, necessity, those are the, those are the watchwords of Kantian ethics. And hospitality is, about, is all about context and about um, situation and about um, thinking about that relationship. So yeah, there's, there's a, some wonderful stories. And here's one of those places where my wonderful co-author, uh, Ray, was really the, the source of a number of them. Uh, he, uh, there's a, there's a short story which became a very famous movie, Babette's Feast, in which uh, this, this uh, French, uh, this brilliant French chef sort of washes up on the shore of um, uh, a, a, a tiny little village in, in Norway, right? Norway or Sweden? Yeah. No, I'm embarrassed that I don't remember. Um, and, you know, she lives with these two women from this very dour and serious and earnest Protestant sect for, for years and years and years, and um, is, is taught by them how to make a dish called ale bread, which is basically bread soaked in ale. Uh, and so for years she does this, and then she wins the French lottery, and she decides to use all of her money to host this amazing uh, feast for the people of this village, all of whom are a part of this very dour religious sect. And it's just a wonderful exploration of the, uh, and you know, of the not very successful negotiation of many of the members of the community to being, being a guest who acknowledges and recognizes the, the gift that they're being offered by this host. Um, one of the stories uh, that Ray brought to my attention is from Ovid, and it's the story, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this right, right but Baucis and Philemon, who are visited by, by some gods. Uh, they're they're an, an elderly and very poor couple, and the gods come to visit them, and they're dressed, uh, they're, they're, they're camouflaged, they're disgu- they've disguised themselves in rags. And Baucis and Philemon proceed to... Um, offer them absolutely everything that they have to, you know, kill the proverbial fatted calf and offer them a very, a very lush and romantic and, and robust meal because um, that's, that's what you do. Um, another story, and now I'm completely forgetting the care, any of the names of any of the characters in it, um, but it comes um, from a work about soil. And, you know, I, I'm so sketchy on the details of this one that it's embarrassing that I'm bringing it up. But at any rate, it involves someone who is, uh, who's who got a price placed on their head. Um, and when the when their killers come to, at, to their village and come to their house to ask them, do you know where to find this person? He says, well, yes, I do. But why don't you first, uh, why don't you first sit down and have a good meal? Um, and so they do that. And then he says, well, you know, why don't you spend the night here? And then while they are spending the night, he generously and graciously goes out in the backyard and digs a hole for his body. And then in the morning says, you know, 
I'm your guy. Um, I'll lie down in here and you can kill me. Uh, it's kind of the, the extreme illustration of, of hospitality. But within, and, and right, we're not advocating any of those story of, of those approaches to hospitality, but simply observing that in the, if you look in the history of, of Western story, let's say, or, and certainly not only Western story, you find these accounts of the ways in which the host and the guest bear responsibilities to each other and how we unfold that is really is really an interesting thing to to take seriously you know certainly and and, and also uh, one thing that i thought was very interesting because of course we have the positive cases right of like hospitality and sort of you know these extreme cases that we just discussed but i also liked uh, in the book you um, you guys discuss basically uh, judas like whose crime might also be understood as a betrayal of hospitality sort of you know uh, uh, the opposite side of that cone i guess Right, right, exactly. No, that's a really great, that's a really great observation. And indeed, we do, we, we, we tell the story in different ways, right? Like you don't usually think of Judas's crime as being about a betrayal of hospitality. Yeah. Yeah. But part of what we're saying is, yeah, but what if you do, right? Like, yes. and I think that's one of the, one of the things that's been sort of a watch or a, a technique of all of my all of my philosophical work, I guess, is to say, yes, yes, I know that we don't usually think about this question through the framework or through the lens of, of food, but what if you do? What mm -hmm. do you start to notice? Um, and I think, uh, you know, it's not an argument that that's the right lens or the only approach. Yeah. It's, it's an observation that we can come to understand some things differently if we do so. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. No, I agree. Like it certainly makes you think, it forces you to think, which is, you know, a good thing. Um, and, and then sort of going beyond sort of, um, although we sort of, uh, uh, you know, recognize that philosophers have sort of ignored this uh, notion of hospitality, you know, we should say not all philosophers, I guess. So you did discuss, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Levinas and uh, Derrida uh, specifically, you know, on this idea of hospitality. So maybe you could uh, say a little bit about, you know, their contributions here. Right, right. And I think I'll focus in on Derrida. Um, and he has that um, pretty, and indeed he he directly addresses it. And you know, it is to him that we can, you know, give give full thanks for the fact that it has entered the philosophical lexicon. Mm -hmm. uh, he makes this distinction between the capital L law and the laws of hospitality. And the law of hospitality is this. I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Actually, this this absolute demand that is un unrealizable in a sense, mm -hmm. right? We are, we, are, we are obliged to provide support to the other. We are, we are obliged to do so, but our capacity to do so is always limited because we are you know, finite human beings. Never mind. the capital L law demands that we provide what others, what others need. Um, on the other hand, there are the laws, the particular laws of hospitality that govern what actual human beings can actually do in actual circumstances. And these two things run very deeply in tension with each other. Um, I, as a philosopher, am so uncomfortable with that, right? Like I, maybe it's my, uh, my upbringing in American pragmatism that leaves me always wanting to be able to resolve and reconcile and come to a conclusion. But I guess I have to admit that the older I get and the more I confront the limitations of humans and the more I see you know, us continue to fail to achieve what we aspire to do, the more I am confronted with the fact that, that this notion that there is an absolute law uh, and that, uh, that there are, that I, no, not that there is an absolute law, that there are demands that vastly outstrip our capacity to achieve them. The more that you know that comes to make really profound sense to me. Um, another figure that another thinker from a really different tradition that I um, that I look to for that is actually the um, virtue theorist Lisa Tessman. She has a book called Burdened Virtues, where she talks about this idea in really really compelling ways. So yeah, and another another aspect of what they're talking about, I think, is that we we as hosts have to confront the otherness of the other and to really wrestle with the fact that we don't necessarily know to whom we are we are coming we don't we don't have enough understanding of what it is that the other needs and demands and requires and that's another aspect i think of that limitation 
Mm-hmm. And so, like, if I understand correctly, there is sort of this, you know, constant tension between, you know, capital uh, L law and, you know, the, the sort of, uh, uh, you know, laws that exist uh, within society and, and, and sort of, you know, the conclusion from that is, you know, let's get comfortable with that. Like, there is this tension, but that's what we have to live with. Right. Right. Exactly. And I think that's, uh, I mean, I think that's been the, the lesson of my last 10 years of life, I guess, is yeah, that's not going away. That's not a temporary condition. That's not, that's not something we're going to fix. Uh, and if we ever do, then it's probably something is probably we're deluding ourselves because that's, that's not fixable, right? That's, that's mm. really there. That's, that's really there. And one yeah. last thing that caught my attention, which I thought was interesting, and I'm not sure if I sort of uh, uh, misheard it or misconstrued that point, but in the sense that, you know, the capital uh, law, right, uh, uh, this ideal that is set forward is sort of unachievable, but nonetheless, we do feel those demands, because I was just thinking about sort of like the the the, the maximum of like, uh, ought implies can, like, is that we're giving yes. up on that notion? We are. Okay. Mm, that's interesting. Yes. yes. Well, that's what, uh, again, that's an and that's at least a testament for this. Yeah, that that ought, <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? I mean, that's just devastating. I'm laughing in that kind of bleak, hysterical way that we do during a pandemic, right? Like, yes, ought implies, does not imply can. Ought, ought implies, <sighs> ought, um, right? And I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know how to negotiate that. Honestly, uh, you know, that's speaking very candidly. Um, I grew up in a, in a religious tradition. I grew up myself a Protestant. I grew up Lutheran. And so there's a sense in which, uh, you know, the Protestant tradition says, yes, that we are, um, you know, we are helpless sinners who, you know, we are obliged to be good, but, you know, we kind of don't succeed in doing so. Um, but, I, you know, I don't know that that's where I look to, um, to understand that kind of notion, I, I, I see it more experientially, I guess. Um, I'm rambling here a little bit because I, because it's something that's very unsettling to me, to be honest. Um, but I think, I think that I just am so constantly confronted by the fact that um, the, the obligations that I can see before me are, are so numerous and so compelling and so obvious and necessary. And I can't, I, I clearly can't achieve them. So just in a very experiential sense, uh, you know, not appealing to anything like the categorical imperative or the golden rule or anything like that, just looking around and thinking, well, you know, for instance, right now with respect to, you know, race relations in the United States in the midst of a pandemic, what are my obligations? Well, they're, they're boundless. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what am I doing? It's very bounded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And even if I were doing everything that I possibly could, which I'm not, uh, I wouldn't be able to do what I ought. Mm. Yeah. So uh, I think, yes, I am, I am giving up on odd implies can. So then all the furniture of, or, you know, all the plumbing has to be re redone. Right. Yeah. No, <laughs> that's like uh, uh, something that I thought was quite stable, but like, yeah, if we do away with that, you know, there's a new project uh, set out for that, but no, that's also uh, exciting and sort of maybe moving on a, a little bit, uh, you know, you also start discussing, uh, you know, the questions, <laughs> what is art and uh, is food art? Um, so, you know, how should we think about that? You, I think set out, you know, two, distinct approaches. Uh, you know, one you mentioned is sort of in the context of a mind-centered, a spectator, a guided a philosophy. And then you talk, you know, uh, coming back to the farming, uh, you know, from the farmer guided, and then also now adding the stomach and down uh, philosophy. Um, so yeah, it would be really under- uh, interesting to understand, uh, you know, those two distinct approaches. So historically in, in the West, uh, we've had this idea of the philosophy, I'm sorry, of the, of, of the arts as being separate in principle from the rest of the world. And so we go to special places to experience them. Um, and we focus on the product or the, the, uh, the painting, the sculpture, the musical work, uh, the work of literature. And we spectators are um, these disembodied minds. And we're looking at a a world of objects, a very embodied world of objects. But um, 
we're not really we're not really interested in our bodies, our bodies' involvement in those in those objects. We're really just, you know, a mind. John Dewey talks about the spectator theory of knowledge. Mm. Well, we we have a spectator theory of aesthetics as well. So we're we're just looking at um, we're just looking at or or listening to those those things. And indeed, we really focus on those. Um, the what, what what are called the distal senses, the ones that don't involve your body actually touching, you know, the work of art. Uh, we just look or listen to it. Um, we're able to uh, we're able to experience that work of art at a distance. There's no touching. It's not doesn't go in our mouths. We don't smell it. We don't touch it. Uh, so by contrast, we're suggesting that we uh, come up with a notion of of art um, and not just of the aesthetic, but really also of art uh, that involves um, participants as, as makers um, and that really involves bodies and that involves the, the experiencer of art being also a participant, a maker, if you will. Uh, we, we again invoke the farmer here. We also talk about you know, the tea ceremony, which is obviously a very rarefied way of, of consuming um, a, a food or a drink, uh, but it nevertheless is one that really focuses on the fact that our bodies are present in this activity. Mm -hmm. So the distinction we really wanna draw is between that kind of, again, between that disembodied, detached, purely mental on the one hand and the deeply um, uh, stomach endowed, um, but still mindful um, participant in aesthetic activity. So again, it comes back to that same dichotomy that, that we start rejecting right at the outset of this book, the, the dichotomy between you know, mind and body, mental substance and physical substance. Um, we just say, you know, we're human beings, and we are we are we are mindful practitioners all the way down. Mm -hmm. And and one uh, important notion I think that you also uh, uh, start discussing, and, and I hope I pronounced it correctly, is like consumatory experiences. Um, oh, uh, right. So maybe you could elaborate on that uh, notion. I think it comes from Dewey, if I uh, uh, remember correctly. So yeah, if you could uh, elaborate, sort of what work that notion is doing, that would also be really helpful. Right. Right. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yes, Dewey uh, has a wonderful work called Art as Experience, um, in which he really develops this notion that that the activity of, of making art and also the activity of looking at art is an experience and that what we're what we attend to is not again so much the object, but rather the activity of engaging whether that's being whether that be the end activity of engaging as the painter or chef or whether it be the engaging as the looker on of a painting or the, the consumer of that meal. Um, and uh, par part of that activity um, or part of that experience might be consummatory. And he, um, he distinguishes between sort of practical and consummatory aspects of an experience. And so, you know, he, he, for instance, would say that you couldn't have a consummatory experience when you solve a geometry problem, right? Where suddenly it's just that, you know, you just have that delicious feeling of seeing the solution finally and realizing how, you know, how beautiful it is, right? It just how, how wonderful it is to have solved that. Uh, that's that, that, consummatory element. And he says, you know, we can have those kinds of consummatory experiences about all kinds of activities. We can also though, uh, you know, so again, cleaning the house or, um, you know, solving a geometry problem, um, they can they can very much be parts of our everyday world or maybe a parts of our professional world, but we can also construct them. Um, we can also seek to construct consummatory experiences and the cat, the, the kinds of things that we're looking at in, um, to really um, capitalize on and, and really manifest a consummatory experience include things like um, paying attention to situation, paying attention to how elements are combined, paying attention to temporality and, and um, what we call fineness. So it's kind of a combination of qualities that all come together to create an opportunity for experiencing 
that is consummatory. And what's really important is it might mean that it's, it's happening at, well, you know, to take the example of food, for instance, it might be that it's about, um, uh, you know, a meal at a, at a, you know, four star Michelin starred uh, restaurant, or it might be at a Kentucky fried chicken restaurant. Um, the set of, the set of circumstances is such that that experience is consummatory. We're not, right, we're not um, equating uh, El Bully and KFC. We're saying that experiences can, can you know, can happen uh, through a combination of those factors that m enables any situation to be capable of creating a consummatory experience. Mm -hmm. That's really fascinating. And, and, and also uh, maybe, uh, uh, you know, reflecting on the fact that, you know, a lot of the history of philosophy has tried to, you know, create, you know, clear distinctions relevant for aesthetics and art. And, you know, we are really sort of reconceptualizing and rethinking it through. And also, as you say, you know, we have, you know, different elements uh, that we have to work with and they can combine uh, in different ways. And, and I thought that's an interesting way of putting it. You mentioned like, you know, Hegel and Kant, they were really emphasizing on the not, right. And, you know, we yes. want to emphasize on the end dimension. Uh, so maybe uh, yes. if you could elaborate on that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, right. Uh, as I said earlier, that the uh, uh, historically and certainly Kant and Hegel are great illustrations of this. We separate art from other things. And, in, you know, that's just a very weird thing to do if you look at many other traditions. Right. Um, you know, I've been doing some work myself on um, the thought of the Dakota, the people who are indigenous, who's on whose land, you know, I occupy. Mm -hmm. uh, and for them, uh, there isn't a kind of a separate category of art. Um, aesthetic, the aesthetic is a dimension of life that um, that weaves through um, the creation of, you know, vessels for everyday use uh, to um, the kinds of ways in which you prepare for important and special ceremonies. It's not a thing that happens in an art museum. It's about combining. Um, it's about acknowledging that there's nothing weird to say that something is both useful and beautiful at the same time. And again, lots of people have, have been thinking about this for a long time, have been trying to push against that notion of the aesthetic as just having to do with, you know, the fine arts. Um, lots and lots of folks are um, creating a movement called everyday aesthetics. I think about like Yuriko, uh, the philosopher Yuriko Saito, who really invites us to to return to that earlier notion of aesthetic as really just being about attention to the sensory qualities of things and really inviting us to pay full attention to uh, full attention to our sensory experience in the world. I've been teaching uh, some of uh, Saito's work actually this year during uh, the pandemic. And it's been really, I have to say to students to be invited as their worlds have been very small to be invited to really pay a lot of attention to making a cup of tea and drinking it for mm -hmm. instance, or mm -hmm. to making your bed carefully each day Mm -hmm. and looking at what it looks like when you've made it. Uh, so I think, you know, uh, of all times, um, the, the present moment uh, is one in which attention to um, these, these sensory qualities of our everyday experience, um, so many of which can happen around food, are really important to us. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe uh, just to go a little bit deeper and sort of, you know, the, the maybe Kantian uh, Hegelian sort of perspective, right? That is trying to maybe create more distance or, you know, talk about this notion of like disinterestedness, right? Where there shouldn't be, a, a, you know, an interest other than, you know, the the object, uh, 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 you know, of aesthetics itself, uh, you know, what are the worries, you know, what are they worried about, right? When we do give up on those notions, right? Like, are we losing out on a notion of objectivity? And do you think that is indeed problematic when we are sort of molding these different elements together? Or do you think something like that can still be saved? Right, right. Uh, so, I mean, lots of times the questions that we're worried about are questions about, can we have objective criteria for aesthetics? And, you know, figures like uh, Hume and Kant acknowledged that when it comes to um, the aesthetic, 
it's not like um, arithmetic, right? We can't make the same kinds of absolute claims. Uh, they, they negotiate and finesse to come up with a kind of objectivity. Hume says, you know, that um, aesthetic value is lodged in the, the ideas of experts, right? So mm -hmm. if, if a whole bunch of people we regard as experts say it is so, then it's so. Um, and Kant comes up with this kind of pseudo um, objectivity for aesthetic judgments. Um, so yeah, do we worry about it? Um, I suppose, um, well, partly I think you might have a better answer to that question than I do. Um, but I, I guess we're really maybe, maybe shifting away from the centrality of that kind of hierarchy of goods and really inviting inviting an emphasis on, on consummatory experiences. But I don't know, um, what do you think we say? <laughs> no, so I mean- <laughs> Put you on the spot a little bit. Yeah, like, I mean, so like, of course I'm, you know, quite new to these uh, questions. And I think I, I see, you know, on the one hand, I see the worry, right? Like there is this worry that, you know, we might lose out on, you know, any relevant notion of objectivity. And I guess there's a similar, similar worry with regards to, you know, in, in ethics, right? Can we have some sort of, a, a, a way of at least coming up with right. you know clear constraints although you know there I mean this might be a little bit mm -hmm. off topic but I think when you at one point in the book you mentioned the notion of reasonableness right and actually you know how I approach Kant I think we can actually also work towards a notion of reasonableness where it doesn't sound algorithmic and I guess you know the question is here as well I see the worries but I also see and I think maybe this also leads to my next mm -hmm. question where I'm sort of dodging uh, entering uh, your question in full which is maybe it becomes clear when we do look at like sort of these uh, you know, combinatorial element, right? Then you mentioned, okay, how does that actually show up in these different ways of, you know, having okay. aesthetic experiences? Because then I think a case is to be made, right? Where you say there's something there in, in sort of, you know, how you're putting forward the case that there's different elements of the aesthetics that we might be zooming mm -hmm. into. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think that at least opens the playing field. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think that's very interesting. So maybe you could, maybe you already uh, elaborated a little bit on it regarding, you know, the KFC case and then, you know, the El Bulli case. Uh, but if you could maybe say how the aesthetic sort of comes out in each of these different cases, I think that's going to really sort of open up the discussion for many people. Yeah, yeah. So um, we, at the beginning of that chapter, um, look at, I guess, three different kinds of cases. And one of them is, I guess it's not El Bulli, it's El Salar. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of these really, you know, fancy um, restaurants where you have this amazing experience and you wait in line or, you know, for years and years on a waiting list to try to get in there. And the, the person who, who, I've never been there, of course, but the article that I read about was about an amazing dessert, which was this kind of complete sensory experience of a, a dessert that's supposed to make you feel like you are a soccer <laughs> goalie that's just there, no, a soccer, not a goalie, the opposite of a goalie, the person that gets the ball past the yeah, goalie and <laughs> makes the point. Um, Messi, is it? I Messi, think that yes, is the Messi, soccer yeah. player. <laughs> yes, and you listen on an iPod to him scoring a goal, and then this thing explodes in your mouth, and so on and so on. Obviously, uh, food as like high architecture, high, you know, high engineering, and, and also, you know, delicious. Then we talk about the American chef, Alice Waters, who spawned something that she calls the delicious revolution, which was really the beginning of an attention to the local and um, local and sustainable cuisine. And then we told the story about um, me going to a Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurant in Ghana when I was um, being hosted by a lovely young Ghanaian woman the restaurant had just opened and she was really excited and keen to go there. And obviously these are really, really different kinds of um, experiences, but you know, we suggest that even these, um, e each of these in their own way is a, is a combination of these different qualities um, uh, that I mentioned earlier, you know, fineness and situation and context and temporality and so on. And, and indeed, it feels to me like it isn't very difficult for us to negotiate between and among them to say, you know, obviously there's a kind of fineness to the dessert at El Salar, which 
is not present in the, the mass produced French fries. But on the other hand, there's always for, and both Ray and I are pragmatist philosophers and for, for us, there's always a way in which it's important and appropriate to ask ourselves the question, what are the, what are the grounds on which we are making that assessment? And what do we think of those grounds? And can we all agree that those are appropriate grounds? Uh, so there is a way in which um, as Deweyans, we say, you know, we are willing to make judgments of quality, but we are always willing to believe that those judgments of quality should be re-examined and should be left open to reinterpretation and reevaluation. Um, I think what, what we are arguing is that in any given context, the context really matters and we need to, to collect and balance and, um, and uh, acknowledge clearly the components that are actually shaping our um, our aesthetic assessment. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to uh, sort of uh, uh, note because, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, in the book, a lot of, you know, dichotomies get sort of overturned, right? Or at least uh, uh, reevaluated. And I guess in this example, you know, how we just went through all these different elements, you know, that might make up an aesthetic experience. I guess maybe, I'm not sure if you agree, but like the dichotomy between theory and practice, right? Instead of trying to create distance and in, instead of trying to abstract away, like it is really constantly engaging. In some sense, like I, I wonder, but you know, I, I'm not uh, uh, well read on, on pragmatism. Like, are we just left with sort of the practice or is the, you know, does it make sense to talk about practice and theory or is, are we just talking about practice? Like, are we leaving theory? Like how to rethink that? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and I think uh, um, there's probably the answer that Ray and I together would give, and then maybe there's a, an answer that I would give that's somewhat different. Um, historically, uh, we are, as I said, both um, uh, followers of John Dewey. Um, and Dewey would say, and does say in so many words, that they are two kinds of practice. Theory and practice are just two mm. kinds of the same activity. And he says, one of them is pushing, slam, bang, act first and think afterwards. And the other is wary and hesitant, sensitive to slight hints and intimations. That's almost a direct quote from him. So for him, it's kind of like fast and slow. <laughs> oh, okay. um, lately, I have become, uh, well, lately in the last 10 years, I've become really interested in um, the French philosopher Michel Serre and his book, The Parasite. And he really invites he's been really inviting me to think about all these dichotomies slightly differently. I mean, Dewey tends to say, let's tunnel underneath the dichotomy and find its roots. Mm -hmm. And, sh and what we see there is then that the, the roots show that these two things are really the same. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of a, that was sort of historically, my approach was let's collapse things into each other. Um, I, more recently, I've come to say, well, there, on the one hand, yes, but on the other hand, the dichotomy keeps persisting and we have to pay attention to that. And so what Sayre gives us with this notion of the parasite is an acknowledgement that these dichotomous relationships are parasitic on each other. So each each side of the dichotomy sort of is eating into the other. It, it depends on the other for its sustenance. It only makes sense because it's chomping into the other side. So theory as a concept only makes sense if we understand practice and practice only makes sense as a concept if we understand theory. So I think now I would be more likely to say the, we can only understand them by understanding, and Sarah also says this, we can only understand them by understanding the relation, that the relation is really the, the thing that constitutes these two entities. So, um, so yeah, I don't want to erase theory. I don't think I wanna go the route of Dewey and say, it's just all, it's all different kinds of theory. I think we lose something important about that tension if we say it that way. I want instead to sort of say, we can only understand these things in relation to each other. And they are always in a situation of having already taken a chomp out of the flank of the other, if I can speak metaphorically. 
um yeah no that that's really yeah that's really fascinating actually <laughs> like these slight differences but yeah they do have uh uh yeah, some consequences. No, that's really interesting. And and maybe uh, moving uh, on a little bit to, you know, the chapter on epistemology, which raises the question, uh, how do we know how we are to eat? Um, and, and, you know, again, it's interesting, you know, I think you mentioned that uh, in the beginning, you started sort of uh, with uh, epistemology. So uh, this is maybe also close to your heart, I guess, like, how is sort of uh, epistemology traditionally uh, done? And how are we, you know, rethinking epistemology? Right, right. And so again, here we encounter this, um, Western theme of the knower as being uh, disembodied and right. Like I'm telling a cartoon version of Western philosophy, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, many of us who do this tend to treat Descartes as our whipping boy, you know, he's the poor guy. Um, uh, he's the person that we, on whom we pin the, the most str um, stark version of the mind body dichotomy, for instance. Uh, so, and, and he certainly is the guy who said, you know, really that what it is to be a, 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 a human is, you know, our essence is to be a thinking thing. And that has nothing at all to do with bodies. And so to be a knower is to be a disembodied thinker um, and to separate theory from practice. And that means that sensorily, the farther away from bodies we can get, the, the, the more reliable our knowledge. So if you have to taste it to know it, then it's not going to be very reliable. Uh, vision is this kind of pure sense. It turns out to be the metaphor, you know, like, yes, we have some hearing metaphors for knowledge, but most of our metaphors for knowledge in the West, um, the places where we don't notice it's a metaphor are going to be vision, right? Like we might say, oh, that smells funny to me, but we're very aware that we're speaking metaphorically. Whereas when we use vision words, we don't think we're being metaphorical. Um, and by contrast, we are saying, let's start with the acknowledgement of us as homo sapiens. And that really means the tasting slash testing species, that, that that's really what our name is, our, our you know, wh where we fall um, in Linnaeus's, you know, organization chart. Um, when I was, when Ray and I were working on this book, I, I, my office is across the hall from the classics department and I wandered over there to chat with one of my friends who's a Latin uh, professor about, about that word. And he said, oh yeah, no, that doesn't mean tasting. And I said, oh really, huh? That's cause that's what my co-author said. And he said, well, let me go look. And he came back shocked to realize that no, ind indeed it does. Mm -hmm. It does mean that uh, it's, it's a much older, apparently a much older meaning. But if we start with the notion that tasting and testing are central activities, as opposed to seeing and thinking, well, it's just a very different kind of activity. And again, it raises all those kinds of worries that you were talking about, about, you know, subjectivity and about perspectivalness mm -hmm. and about the limitations of our view and can we ever actually achieve objectivity and so on. And I think, you know, I guess, you know, to come back to that question again that you asked with respect to aesthetics and to hit already here with respect to epistemology. We're not arguing against the possibility of at some times and in some circumstances being able to distill out perspective and context and uh, specificity of experience. We're saying that to say, suggest that that's the, the only thing or that that's the gold standard or that that's the only way to think is, yeah. um, is a mistake. That's, the, that's where the mistake comes in. Uh, that kind of sliding over or, or eliding or trying to skip to the degree possible, all that kind of specificity is really, uh, that's where the problem comes. Oh, so one thing that comes to mind and now also, you know, when we look at the different senses, right, and how we use that, so, you know, talking about vision, I mean, one uh, popular thing, uh, I guess this was the name of the book of Thomas Nagel, if I remember correctly, like the view from nowhere, which is really, in the some sense, nowhere pushing that point right so i was wondering like is there a parallel a parallel like if we think about balancing right these different modes of knowing is there sort of a parallel uh, you know with sort of the tasting testing model that is also sort of 
pushing the point like similar from the view from nowhere, but then from like a tasting perspective? I'm not sure if that question makes sense. So meaning meaning sort of the view from some very particular where? Yes, exactly. If you push that point like sort of to the max, yeah. like where do you end up? <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so I guess where you end up is, um, would be in a, an error um, of it, right? Where there's nothing like generality. There are only specificities. There are only particularities. There are only, um, in fact, uh, there's a, this is kind of a strange analogy or example maybe, but um, do you know the, 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 the writer, the fiction writer, Borges? I don't um, know. B-O-R-G-E-S. Mm. Um, okay. He, uh, he wrote a series of really amazing short stories um, that are collected in a book called labyrinths. Uh, and one of the stories is, I think it's called Funes the Memorius. Mm. And it's about a guy who um, has no general categories. Everything mm. in his world is a particular thing. Mm. Everything. Um, he, he dies. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he cannot, he cannot, I, I, I think that he doesn't die because of that. He dies for other reasons. But but you are confronted with the fact that it is impossible to live if everything is particular. And so I think I, if I'm getting your question correctly, yeah. I would say the view from, yeah. from this very, from the view from the inside of my mouth yes. or, yes. you know, yes. the taste from the inside of my mouth um, taken to the extreme becomes meaningless as well, right? It, it cannot be communicated. Mm -hmm. No, that's like was really my question. And I didn't know where it would lead. But I mean, I think that's a, a you know, very interesting uh, uh, conclusion. And I think, yeah, that that sounds uh, 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 right to me. And, and also in this context, I guess, uh, another dichotomy that this qu seems quite classic to me is like the fact value dichotomy uh, uh, that uh, you guys are sort of uh, overturning. And um, so maybe uh, if you could explain maybe uh, very briefly what this dichotomy yeah. sort of amounts to. And again, how are we doing away with uh, another classic dichotomy? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. This one is uh, this one. <laughs> I'm kind of you know I'm like hoping everything is nailed down here because you know this is one of those that's cut, regarded as really uh, for analytic philosophers. This is just, yeah. this is just foundational. You're now playing around with you know the the cornerstones, yeah. Um, yeah. and for. Uh, philosophers in the American pragmatist tradition, um, it's just, it's just not, it's just not there. Um, we argue, so the fact value distinction, uh, it's most simple form of it, we could boil down to saying you can't derive an ought statement from an is statement. Um, and to put it in less um, philosophy of language terms, um, you can't make a claim about the way somebody should behave on the basis of a particular fact. So uh, let's take an extreme case. You know, infants are born very vulnerable. Um, well, that's a fact. Um, you can't derive from that any claim about what ought to be the case, right? That therefore adults ought to care for them. Um, and I think I, you know, I sort of stack the deck in choosing that example, right? Because I think many of us in our ordinary lives would say, well, for God's sakes, if that is, is statement doesn't, you know, prescribe what we ought to do, well, then we're not going to go very far as a species, right? Our experience in the world challenges this dichotomy all the time. So I picked obviously an inflammatory example, but in the book, we talk about the fact that the grocery shopper confronts these kinds of is ought, um, these entanglements between is statements or, or, or facts and values all the time. Uh, I, I, I have to walk into the grocery store with a set of commitments and convictions and then make my choices according to that list of commitments and convictions. I can't separate those. I can't, um, I can't, sort them out because they are always built into the conditions of my life you know that and those conditions include things like you know i've got a kid who has celiac i've got a limited budget um my you know my uh you know a million a million things my my family's um trying to keep kosher for passover and 
I live in a town that doesn't have any good kosher grocery store. You know, all these things together mean that um, what I am to do, how I am to make choices is, uh, is wound around with these, with these uh, value challenges. Mm-hmm. No, I think, yeah, that's very fascinating. And I think it's a very ambitious, you know, uh, project also like constantly rethinking uh, those uh, dichotomies, but certainly uh, 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 worth it. And then, you know, now we have a different sort of picture of epistemology, which a lot of people might assume now, okay, we might also start getting a different picture on metaphysics, uh, uh, or at least some people uh, might think that, I guess. So now moving to metaphysics, uh, uh, you discuss again, s- similar to, I guess, you know, the two different uh, distinct approaches uh, with regards to epistemology. Now we have two yeah. distinct approaches with regards to uh, metaphysics uh, and just to sort of introduce them i guess you talk about the metaphysics of self-sufficiency and then uh, you know you introduce uh, uh, you know this new idea of metaphysics which talks about the metaphysics of interdependence um so yeah, yeah. could you maybe tell us a little bit more about you know how are we going to uh, you know enter into metaphysics and potentially how it relates i guess to you know the epistemology we've just been talking about yeah yeah, and as as you noted at the beginning, you know this this book is somewhat surprising in that it uh, it does address all these uh, branches of philosophy you might think in a philosophy of food that is mostly about ethics and aesthetics. Yeah. Yeah. And indeed, one of the exciting things to me is uh, that lots, well, maybe not lots, but more philosophers working on food are starting to think about these uh, metaphysical questions as well. So, in the hist- again, in the history of philosophy, if we look at the you know the 18th century. We, ha- we have the emergence of atomic theory, like literally atomic theory atoms. Um, and that that is also at work in conceptions of personhood. So, you know, the model of the atom as a billiard ball also gets deployed to be the model of a person, right? Like, and the mm-hmm. billiard ball is this, you know, spherical thing with no openings and it happens to encounter other billiard balls, right? You know, mm-hmm. it just happens to. Right? Like the whole game is about billiard balls encountering each other, but, but we still regard that as sort of an accidental thing. But the billiard ball itself, each one is you know, self-contained and self-sufficient. It's, it's not dependent on anything else for its existence. It's not needy. Um, by contrast, we are, we are um, inviting people to think of, of humans as needy, as not at all independent, um, as as not at all self-sufficient. And again, um, it's, it's so interesting, I think for folks who are coming to this work, not from studying the history of Western philosophy, it might feel like some of what we're arguing is unnecessary because like, who would think such a thing? But indeed we do. I mean, the models of what it is to be a person take out this, you know, narrow slice of some people's lives, right? That narrow slice between what, I don't know, 20 and 70, Mm -hmm. where you're, where you can kind of convince yourself that you're independent and you don't rely on others. Baloney, right? Like we do, we are not independent. We do rely on others, but we can kind of pretend that we do. And Mm -hmm. we then, you know, lop off the part where you're old. We lop off the part where you're a baby and we lop off any circumstances that mean that you are dependent on others for, you know, mobility or or nutrition or any of those sorts of things. And we call that what it is to be a human being. Mm -hmm. Uh, And we instead say, hey, instead, let's think about all those parts of us, all those parts of our needy, hungry, 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 um, selves. Ray was really the one who imported that language of, you know, mm. the hungry self and the, hungry. and the stomach endowed person. I love that language because it reminds us, yeah, what we are is hungry. That's what mm. we are. We're hungry and then we die, right? You know? mm-hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. And so uh, if that's where we start, we, we have a very different kind of notion of uh, of the of the metaphysics of interdependence, um, and we talk about three different ways in which um, um, we can reevaluate um, our our world. I guess if we come at it rather than from a metaphysics of self sufficiency, if we come at it from the metaphysics of interdependency, um, one of them is. Um, the relationship between nature and culture again mm-hmm. another of those dichotomies right so um if we acknowledge the fact that what we mean by nature is always a thing that is deeply culturally endowed um we realize that you know inviting us to live according to nature for instance is always a cultural concept mm-hmm. these two activities you know and to use my my analogy from Sayre, the concept of nature and the concept of culture kind of bite into each other and and they have their sense 
they have their meaning because of the relationship between the two of them. Farming is one activity. Um, culturing food is another activity that really invites us to pay attention to that relationship between, uh, between nature and culture. And that really emphasizes that, you know, that interdependence, that metaphysics of dependence. Um, <clears throat> Likewise, a uh, perennial th uh, topic in metaphysics is the notion of freedom. Um, are we free? Um, and in the in philosophy informed by mod the moderns, that notion has tended to mean something like free will, uh, cultivating the capacity to make certain choices. Um, and it's been something like you're either born with it or you're not. And for us, we're rather seeing it as, um, I'm sorry, we're trying to see it as something about cultivating that capacity to make choices. So it's not something you're born with, it's something that you achieve and you achieve it always in a particular context. So it's not just like, well, you, well, humans either have free will or they don't have free will. And, and that's all that can be said about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the last one is this notion of authenticity, which gets, you know, that gets a lot of airplay, actually, when you're thinking about food, um, rather than um, peeling away layers to get at the true authentic self, mm -hmm. we're acknowledging that um, what we are authentically, again, is really a cultural product that um, it's not about finding the nugget of us that's inside of it all. That's the true billiard ball yeah. that's mm -hmm. just been, yeah. you know, painted over. It's that um, what we are is um, the result of all of these interactions. Um, yeah. No, that's yeah, really fascinating. And I, you know, all, all of these notions indeed, you know, are, are very much, you know, uh, hugely debated, I guess. But I also thought it was very fascinating uh, uh, that in the end you say, you know, this topic of metaphysics brings us also back, you know, full circle with ethics. I think, you know, that also is, uh, uh, you know, very nice. So in, in what sense, you know, uh, to, to, to make it more concrete, I guess, does metaphysics that we just talked about touch back on specifically the virtual source of hospitality? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's uh, this hungry being, this stomach and sold or stomach endowed creature is all about responding. It's about responsibility. It's about response. It's about what do I do in this situation? What do I do in this context? How do I behave given that this is what I am, given that these are the relationships in which I am embedded and the relationships uh, that are contained within me? Because, of course, you know, I'm also um, like, I am a highway full of bacteria, right? Uh, so what I am as a creature is a really complicated um, set of interconnections. And I have to think about my responsibility to those, those to whom I play host and those, you know, who play host to me. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, one thought that comes to mind, uh, uh, and I'm not entirely sure if, if this makes sense, but, you know, I also was thinking, you know, when you talk about sort of the metaphysics of interdependence, one sort of natural uh, uh, notion, I guess, that comes out of that is thinking about like ecosystems, right, which might be uh, uh, relevant uh, for uh, um, food, would, be, would that be quite right. correct? <laughs> right, yes, absolutely. In fact, uh, I'm really interested in thinking about um, about that notion, because I've been doing actually a lot of work since this book, um, yeah. thinking about yeah. um, metaphysics and the metaphysics of person. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, one of the thinkers that has been really intriguing me is Anna Tsing, T S I N G. She's an anthropologist, and she has a book called "The Mushroom at the End of the World" on living life in capitalist ruins. It's a fascinating, fascinating book. But she um, invites us to think rather than about ecosystems as communities, she suggests thinking about us as assemblages. And, and what she means by using that word is to acknowledge the kind of precariousness and temporariness of these. Uh, and another thing that she really wants to emphasize is that these assemblages invite us to notice that, that the notion of selves or of self-sufficient beings gets even further eroded when you realize that these assemblages create the conditions in which what it is to be a particular thing change, right? Like evolution is happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And part of what's going on is that when a given set of organisms 
interacts with its, you know, with each other in a particular context at a particular time, you know, and particularly at a particular time in the the Anthropocene era where change is happening so mm-hmm. rapidly. Yep. Um, what it is to be this particular microbe is going to change as a result of that. What it is to be this particular nematode, this little tiny worm that's infecting the forests of Oregon and Japan in very different ways. What that nematode is and is is like will will vary depending upon on what that assemblage is and what it does. So really, she's she's really pushing me to think about the whole notion of what it is to be in much more uh, fluid and changing ways. And so, and so, you know, I know you started by asking about ecosystems. So for her, this e- we need a way to understand ecosystem that acknowledges the constancy of change and that acknowledges the way in which change really shakes up everything. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and then maybe uh, as a final question, uh, uh, you know, which kind of connects to uh, my previous question, you know, already touch upon, you know, the, the you know, future research uh, directions, you know, what you've been looking into. So maybe uh, for, like personally, from your perspective, you know, what are the questions from a philosophy of food perspective that you, you know, are pursuing? And then maybe also just a broader picture, you know, in your view, what are the exciting questions out there uh, for the philosophy of food that, you know, should be addressed? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a very slow worker. And so I've been working on this book for a long time, I'm embarrassed to say, but it's, uh, it's got sort of the working title of it's chomping all the way down. And it really is an exploration of personhood, uh, taking seriously the, um, the, the predominance of the parasite. And by predominance, I mean, like partly in the natural world, the degree to which parasitic relationships are like, that some biologists say parasitic relationships are the most common kind of relationships on the planet. Mm-hmm. And I think, well, how can that even be since we're always trying to exterminate parasites? But in fact, these kinds of relationships that, that diminish one thing to the benefit of the other are just wildly, wildly prolific. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I'm trying to think about how that can be kind of an anal- uh, uh, a model for understanding human personhood and then what happens for us um, for conceptions of things like health and ethics if we take that kind of model of personhood seriously. So, uh, so I've been giving you, I think, probably a pretty good foretaste of some of those things in, in sort of my asides here during this interview. Um, as for um, exciting research directions in philosophy of food more generally, first of all, it's just exciting that we can even talk about that. You know, again, I started by talking about the fact that, you know, I was the laughing stock of um, many job interviews. And, you know, our first book, people would um, tack the notice of the book, you know, from the book catalog on their office door with a little note under it saying like, you know, oh, can you believe where the profession has fallen, you know, so far, like, this, you know, what's next philosophy of dust, you know. Um, And now, of course, um, people all over the world are teaching philosophy of food classes, food aesthetics and ethics. And so I guess from my very, very perspectival vantage point, among the things I'm excited by are that we're seeing philosophers in all the major sort of strains of Western thought engaging in philosophy of food. So philosophy of food, the analytics, the pragmatists and the, and the continental folks are all exploring these questions from different perspectives, which is really exciting. I mean, it really means that for instance, people can teach classes in ways that are really, um, that are, that are cross, you know, cross tradition. Um, Another thing that's exciting is that, as I've mentioned, I guess, uh, we're seeing obviously ethics and sociopolitical philosophy and aesthetics, um, but also ontology and epistemology. So it's really, really possible to explore all of these. Uh, It's possible to find work in all of these. I think it would probably be possible. Yeah, I'm sure it would be possible to teach a class in the aesthetics of food, the ontology of food. Yep. Uh, you could also do it like from the vantage point of eating versus food, um, yep. right? Um, I'm excited about the fact that um, people are being hired in jobs that have the word food in their title, you know, food and philosophy. That's just amazing to me. And that people are founding things like institutes, you know, 
typically they don't have much money to do this, but but they are saying we we can create an infrastructure that enables us to, you know, trade ideas. And during the pandemic, that's been really wonderful. So I think, for instance, of and uh, Andrea Borghini, uh, University of Milan. He founded a thing called Culinary Minds, and during the pandemic, he's been he's been doing these um, wonderful sort of colloquia online. Mm. And those, by the way, are all um, archived. And so people can go and find them at Culinary Mind. Uh, he is co-editing a book on recipes. Recipes are a really hot topic right now. Another person that's working on recipes is Bob Valgenti. Um, and Bob is, uh, Bob is in the continental tradition. And he's also one of the editors at the journal Gastronomica. Gastronomica is a neat journal. It's kind of a crossover uh, journal that's both academic and popular. It's not mm -hmm. just philosophy. It's, you know, food in all kinds of disciplines. But, but having Bob there as one of the editors is really, really terrific because it means we've got a philosopher who's keeping his eye out for those texts. Um, We've had we you know uh, Michigan at Michigan State, uh, which has a long tradition of um, philosophy of agriculture, with the work of uh, Paul Thompson, mm -hmm. has recently hired Megan Dean, who is a philosopher who works on food ethics, um, and you know she's teaching classes on you know the food ethics from the vantage point of eating. Mm -hmm. um, David Kaplan, for a long time, has been doing really great work at University of Texas, also from the uh, the uh, continental tradition. He has uh, for a long time curated a, a website called something like the philosophy of food, um, which is a great place for people to go to see, you know, what's being written about. Uh, environmental studies continues to be a really important uh, entry point for thinking about food and philosophy or thinking about eating and philosophy. So folks like Aaron McKenna at the University of Oregon, who's um, written this series of books on um, our relationships with animals uh, and animals are food or in are engaged in the procuring of food in all kinds of interesting ways. Uh, Tyler Doggett and Ann Barnhill have done a lot of really great work on food ethics and on eating animals and on food and public policy. And then um, in the realm of the aesthetic, uh, uh, Nicola Perullo at um, the University of Gastronomic Sciences in Italy um, has founded this wonderful Master of Gastronomy program in which um, philosophy is really the, um, it's the spine, I guess I would say of the program. Yep. And he's doing really interesting work on everyday aesthetics. So, I mean, that was just, when I just scratched my head a little bit, I came up with that list of places and things and people and ideas that are happening in philosophy of food. And that's just, that's just astonishing to me. <laughs> you know, I'm constantly, you know, sometimes I kind of put my hands on my hips and I'm like, wait a minute, how come you're, you know, what? because you, when you start doing something and you're the only person doing it, you sort of have to remind yourself, no, but the goal here was for lots of people to be doing this. Mm -hmm. And now, now that goal has been realized. It's quite exciting. No, that that's really fascinating. And, you know, I will link, uh, uh, you know, uh, a few of these places also oh, in the perfect. in the description so people can uh, try to find it and actually a few people uh, that you mentioned will also be on the podcast so uh, uh, yeah very excited for that um, so um, yeah Lisa I've been really enjoying this conversation so I, I would like really like to thank you uh, for uh, participating participating in this series and uh, being part of this and uh, I'm not sure if you have any parting words to the audience well, I, um, I encourage you to uh, explore your own eating, I guess is what I would say. And to think of everyone as a philosopher, in my humble opinion. And so I just invite you to be, to be a philosopher of your own food. <laughs>